Welcome, Dr. Arden Morris. Dr. Morris is Professor of Surgery and Vice Chair in the Department of Surgery for Research at Stanford University. Welcome, Dr. Morris. Thank you. Could you start, please, by telling us a little bit about your, your role in research at Stanford, as, as well as your background that got you to that point? Sure, yeah. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, for a long time, I've been very interested in health services research and outcomes research. So not so much in inventing new treatments, but rather applying what we know works, and um, which is a very complicated process, and then um, determining how well it actually does work. So um, it's, it's the other side. After the invention comes the application and implementation, and that's what I've studied. And particularly um, looking at big picture, the, um, uh, the infrastructure of healthcare in our country, down to the micro level, what is it that doctors and patients are doing together to help the patient get better? Um, I did a special fellowship uh, for two years in this before I did my colorectal surgery fellowship. And that was called the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. I got an MPH during that time. And then after finishing my clinical fellowship, I um, became faculty at University of Michigan and spent 13 years there. My primary mentor was John Berkmeyer, whom many people know as uh, sort of the king of outcomes, I would say, in the early 2000s. Um, and he has a lot of uh, a lot of mentees like me who have gone out and developed our own programs. I was recruited to Stanford to start a health services research center in the Department of Surgery here. That's called Espire Center, Stanford Surgery Policy Improvement Research and Education Center. <laughs> Sorry for all that, but it's the Espire Center. Um, and what I do is um, try to, uh, well, within our group, we have people of, of, from various disciplines. We work together to try to conduct research that informs change through policy or through um, new knowledge about how well what we think works is actually working. So those are, the, so basically practice change and policy change. That's what we're aiming at. Along the line of, of practice change, one of the fantastic things, one of many that, that you've done to help us improve patient outcomes as we take care of our patients, is to help develop and, and spearhead the effort to develop the synoptic report for, for rectal cancer for the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. But before we discuss specifically the, the NAPRC, Perhaps you could give us a little overview of, of, of the history and, and current status of synoptic reports and, and, and uh, why synoptic reports would be preferred to narrative free text. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, our tradition, of course, in surgery especially is narrative free text, but probably in every field, actually. And um, there are some fields, radiology and pathology in particular, where communication is at least as important as the activity, the um, physician activity that occurs, which involves looking at basically slicing up specimens, looking at them under a microscope, applying special stains. But the communication of the findings is really paramount. Same thing for um, radiology as uh, understanding how to protocol the imaging, doing the Im getting the imaging, and then communicating it is at least as important as anything else. And in fact, the, um, the conduct of what is done is probably, um, it's irrelevant if there's no communication afterward. As surgeons, our situation is a little bit different. What we do is rearrange people's anatomy, and we've always considered that to be the most important thing, and communication has really been secondary. But now we're in a new era of multidisciplinary care and um, we're finding that this is so much better for patients. It's better in every single way. Uh, there's less waste involved. There are better outcomes. And so communication, so we need to step up our communication as surgeons. So in terms of the history of synoptic reports, this has been in place for quite some time in radiology and in pathology, but it was proposed by you and some others um, uh, in surgery. And in fact, it's been investigated in Canada by different uh, people maybe a little bit siloed. I hope that's not offensive to the uh, really good researchers who've looked at it, but hasn't really taken off in the United States so much. It's just starting to, and I think the national accreditation programs are a great way to accomplish that. Um, for the NAPRC, I was um, actually initially contacted, I think it was by Dave Dietz who asked me to start working on this, and it was based on a checklist that the American Society of Colorectal 
Colon and Rectal Surgeons Quality Committee put together um, with lots of input from many different people about best practices in rectal cancer care. So we started from that and put together a proposed synoptic op report and it went through many iterations with a lot of smart people weighing in on what we should add and what we should remove. And ultimately we came up with something that we thought would work that the committee members agreed that they would be willing to try. Um, and we put that into the field and then asked for feedback on how it went. And can you just divulge, if you're at liberty to, if it's in public domain yet, the results of, of what was found with your pilot study uh, of the, I guess it's a, at least an epic, a dot phrase, NAPRC um, uh, operative synoptic report, which I must say, editorial comment, that I, I'd used it as one of your guinea pigs and mm -hmm. found it very easy and quick, but I'd like to know what the real results were. Thank you so much for being a guinea pig. <laughs> We had 34 surgeons across the country who tried it out, uh, and your comments were very valuable. Um, we, we uh, after deploying it, we showed people how to download it. Um, it requires an Epic IT person to download it from Epic from the Epic Community Library into any any institution's um, Epic, because as we know, Epic is a little bit different in every single institution. It's also in Cerner, but I don't know Cerner, so I don't know how to access it there. And then Sam Hendren at University of Michigan created a laminated card and she disseminated that uh, to um, take care of it until they could get it into their EMR. So that was really useful for those who didn't have Epic or Cerner or who otherwise didn't have access. So in terms of the results, we found that even though um, very experienced and I would say outstanding colorectal surgeons reported that they thought they already included all of these 19 critical items in the Synoptic Op Report, in their traditional narrative report, the truth is that they, they didn't include them. They inferred them, but it was not very clear. And when we had a highly educated uh, person review the operative report, uh, somebody with an advanced degree, but who is not a surgeon, they couldn't identify these elements in those operative reports. I could infer them in some cases, but we're not gonna have surgeons that are coming through the operative reports to try and figure out whether or not these things were done. Um, so it has to be, it has to be clear. It has to be really crystal clear without uh, interpretation, without um, in-depth interpretation needed. Um, and so we found that only in about, um, at best, in about 65% of cases were these items included. Um, but after implementation of the synoptic operative report, it was nearly 100% in every single case. Um, we have put this into the public domain in terms of a publication which has open access in diseases of the colon and rectum. I'm trying to remember what month that was published. It was, it was sometime in the last 12 months and I can't remember precisely when it was published, but it's out there. Um, and what we found was that there was a lot of resistance, even among people who participated in creating it, there was still a lot of resistance. And that was because as surgeons, we are used to doing um, 150 percent of things in 100 percent of the time. We, we can't create more time, but we can stuff more things into the time, and that's what we do. And so workflow is incredibly important, and having ways of getting things done very, very quickly is important to surgeons without having to learn something new. Um, many of our guinea pigs reported that that was their initial resistance, and once they got used to it, they developed a, a new workflow and implemented it. And after that, it, it really wasn't difficult for them. Um, I thought that there would be one or two ways that it was implemented. And I learned that there were about 10 or 15 ways it was implemented. So it really depended on, on the individual and their institution and how they were set up and how they normally did things. Really, so the implementation was not a one size fits all. Interesting, once it's implemented, and people find it easy to use and, and they go and use it. What are some of the downstream potential utilities of, of having 100% data capture as opposed to 60 or 65% data capture? Uh, I really like that question. I think that there are um, sort of some big categories. So number one, how does this help patients? Um, in terms of helping them directly, individual patients directly, I'm not sure that it actually makes, has an impact on the patient whose operation was just completed. Um, however, it can educate surgeons who maybe did not complete a colorectal surgery fellowship or in some other way just don't have the same uh, understanding. It gives us a common language for uh, 
we, we all were trained in various different ways. And so it gives us a common language to talk about these things. We can understand each other's operative reports better when we need to go in and do re redo surgery, which we know comes up. Um, it allows uh, people who are abstracting charts to uh, more easily find the data. And as we were talking about, not do as much interpretation. Um, it can help the community at large by showing us what things matter. When we can um, accurately record what was done in ways that are, are um, easily identifiable, then we can see what really matters for improved patient outcomes over time. So there's a real boon to the community and that means patients downstream. And that's what I really think, um, for me, that's kind of really the a massive benefit is the boon to patients downstream as we learn and we all improve. And we know that that's happening. We know that we're actually improving over time because we can look at our outcomes and see if they're better as time passes. So, so as we realize these benefits and recognize that it's not really terribly odious and in fact, it may improve workflow uh, as opposed to going back to dictate an operative addendum because something was forgotten or the coding person says you didn't clarify such and such, but, you, but now you can't close the encounter unless you've done it. Uh, we're going to move towards using more of them. The Commission on Cancer, of course, is going to start uh, in the next year requiring they be used in, in different scenarios. Uh, and, and then the question after that becomes, can we completely dispense with any narrative report or will we still, for the foreseeable future, need to occasionally augment the synoptic report with the narrative free text report? At this time, I think that most surgeons in the United States will want to accompany the operative report with a narrative report, or at least have space to describe um, unexpected findings. And human beings aren't like airplanes. You know, every single person is different on the inside. And so there are some things that we will want to describe individually. Um, you know, I really think 10 or 15 years from now, instead of having an operative report, we're probably going to have some kind of a, a video. And so having a synoptic report that accompanies that, that we've all agreed on is appropriate, is going to be very valuable. Thank you very much for your time today, for your interview with From the Front Lines, for the ACS Bulletin Brief, and thanks for all that you've done. Uh, for the uh, world of surgery and especially for our patients. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You say that it doesn't help the individual patient. I'm not necessarily sure because when a patient comes back for another visit years later, being able to know exactly what was done quickly may be of value if the patient changes physicians or, or decides to transfer somebody to retire someone else in the practice. I, I would go beyond what you said, and I, I think it is even a value to the initial patient uh, the, that index patient at future dates, not necessarily during the hospitalization, but at future dates and by other people. But again, that's just my opinion and there's no evidence to, to support it yet. I suspect one day there may be. Yes. Yeah. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad we're in agreement. And uh, again, thank you so much. I'm really impressed with what you do. Keep it up. I uh, hope to see you someday again in the not too distant future in person as opposed to on a screen when we can again travel. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.